And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today, Douglas Fisher and Nancy Fry. Um, first up, I've got Douglas Fisher, PhD, is a professor of educational leadership at San Diego State University and a teacher leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. Previously, Doug was an early intervention teacher and elementary school educator. He is the recipient of an International Reading Association William S. Gray Citation of Merit and an Exemplary Leader Award from the Conference on English Leadership of NCTE. He was also recently inducted into the Reading Hall of Fame by the Literacy Research Association. He has published numerous articles and books on teaching and learning, such as the Teacher Clarity Playbook, PLC Plus, Visible Learning for Literacy, Comprehension, The Skill, Will, and Thrill of Reading, How Tutoring Works, How Learning Works, Teaching Reading, and Leader Credibility. Doug loves being an educator and hopes to share that passion with others. Thank you, Doug, for being with us today. And next, it's my pleasure to introduce Nancy Fry. Nancy Fry, PhD, is a professor in educational leadership at San Diego State and a teacher leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. She is a member of the International Literacy Association's Literacy Research Panel. Her published titles include Visible Learning and Literacy, This is Balanced Literacy, Removing Labels, Rebound, and many, many more. Nancy is a credentialed special educator, reading specialist, and administrator in California, and learns from teachers and students every day. Thank you, Nancy, for being with us today. And with that, I will hand over the mic and mm. let you guys get to it. Thank you, and thank you. All. Nancy, don't you love when all those little reactions fly up on our screen? I do. I love watching that. It's like, I I, for me, it's like <laughs> people are throwing confetti. Yeah, right. <laughs> love it. Oh, look at all go again. Oh, I guess. Super fun. <clears throat> all right. You already know this because you all decided to be here. Vocabulary is essential, critical. It's so important that we attend to vocabulary. And yes, you will get the slides. You will get the recording and some follow-up from CORE when, when these free webinars are finished. So vocabulary is super important, critical to what we do. Words are tools that we use to express our ideas, to learn new concepts, to access our background knowledge. Words are super important. Now, if you are in a common core state location or a former common core state or a quitter state or a never adopted state, you probably have a significant amount of your standards related to vocabulary. We live in California and 12 and a half percent of our standards <coughs> are related to vocabulary. That is a huge percentage of the standards. So guess what's on the test? When students are assessed, a huge amount of that is related to vocabulary. And there's a good reason for that. Vocabulary profoundly influences our understanding of text and we can be manipulated, marginalized and taken advantage of if we don't understand the vocabulary. So it's useful. Today, we hope to expand knowledge about vocabulary instruction, like thinking differently about what we know about vocabulary, summarizing hundreds of studies about what we know. Successfully, how will we know if we're going to be successful? We're going to describe a comprehensive vocabulary initiative. What do we mean by this, including modeling of word solving? We're going to use some self-assessment rubrics to identify strengths, needs in your department or grade in school. And at the end, we'll talk about how vocabulary contributes, sorry, <coughs> contributes to the overall skilled reading that students need to do. Now, when you look at John Hattie's database, vocabulary has a strong influence on overall learning. It is an above average influence and it has the potential to accelerate learning. But the fact is we don't learn words. We don't learn, and this is so hard to get our minds around, we don't learn words, we learn concepts. That's probably why isolated word instruction doesn't work much, because if you don't have a concept for it, you don't learn the word. We don't learn words, we learn concepts. Words are labels for those concepts that we have. Super important to recognize this. We want to focus on concepts, ideas, information, and then attach labels to that. Mm -hmm. 
Let's watch. Even the youngest children who are starting to attach labels to the concepts that they've been thinking and studying. So what book have we been reading this week? Hungry uh, Caterpillar. The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Okay, so what do you see in here? I see a big butterfly. A big I, butterfly? I see some strawberries I see, and an I see a lollipop. A lollipop, some strawberries. What else do you see in there? I see a pearl, two pearls, and I see, what's this? Two pears? What might this be? Hmm? What is this? A hot dog. <laughs> Don't you see a hot, a dog? hot dog? Sure. What else do you see in there? An orange. And I see And I see that. Okay. Okay, so we gave you some little tools to use, right? Some little tools. Okay, so go ahead, dig around and tell me what you see. I see this. Kaylee, dig around in there. What do you see? I see some rocks. You see some rocks? What else do you see? A strawberry. A strawberry? And that's it. What did you find? I found a Why do you think I there's a butterfly it. in there? Can I eat the lollipop? No, not yet. Oh, not yet. Put that back. What else do you see, Kaylee? What's in there? And I see a caterpillar. A caterpillar? Can you show me the caterpillar? Can you dig them out and show them to me? I think Great job. And the magnifying glass and looking at things and labeling things. What does it feel things. like? Soft. Feel soft? What else? And what I love about this, Doug, is, is that they are attaching okay, all of so this to text. Okay, so let me ask text. you guys a question. Are you ready? Wow, what, is this so what is this on the side right here? What did you learn? Caterpillar. The caterpillar's turning into a what? Butterfly. A butterfly. What's this called? A cocoon. a cocoon. Do you remember what that, that's called when they turn into a butterfly? It's a really long word. Do you remember what it's called? Huh? What's it called? Metamorphosis. Ah. I got Good this. job. What's that? Are you going to build with the sand? Okay. What else do you see in here? Why do I have all this in here? All right. Thank you for entertaining us because with why? that. Nancy. Why is all this in Watching here? Watching those kids attach labels to the concepts. And yes, asking students questions. Do you have a concept for it? Here's a label. Here's a concept. You have a label. That's how our vocabulary grows. Even with our youngest kids expanding their knowledge of words and concepts. And even getting to at the very end, man, a five syllable word metamorphosis, right? We don't just learn that word. We're also learning the concept with that. But people often ask us, well, what, what does it mean actually to know a word or to know a phrase? And of course, we stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of understanding this. Folks like Bill Nagy, folks like Michael Graves, who have really investigated this. And what they talk about in particular is that we know words and you can sort of measure knowledge of words in two ways. One is the breadth of the words that a student knows. And at least at a very superficial level, they know some words better than others. But that also means that there are some words that they know in more depth as well. We might know words superficially, but then there are other words or phrases that we know uh, in terms of their pronunciation, their spelling, their meaning, their morphology, how it is their form, and especially their syntax, how it is that you use those in clauses and in sentences. And the fact of the matter is, thank goodness, we learn vocabulary words through two important channels. We, there are some vocabulary terms that we learn through incidental vocabulary learning and others explicit vocabulary learning. And that's actually very good news for us because Nagy estimates that by the time a student leaves eighth grade, they need to know 88,500 word families, far beyond what it is that anybody could teach. Fortunately, we acquire a lot of our vocabulary incidentally. 
And ways that we can foster that in our classrooms include things like noticing and discussing unfamiliar words, especially during those interactions, just like you saw that preschool teacher do. That's exactly what it is that she did. She folded in new terms along the way and using those words in conversations and rhymes and songs, asking students to read it. Now, having said that, there are some words that we really do need to teach explicitly as well to provide direct instruction around that and to be able to utilize those with intention in their discussion and demonstrate how it is that those are utilized and how you solve for those unknown words. Thank goodness you really can't take apart or decouple vocabulary learning from reading. Reading is an essential part of this. We build reading to build vocabulary. And Doug, I know you're going to talk with us about reading volume as an aspect of this. Yes, and we're going to talk about all kinds of different grade levels in the short time we get you all uh, <clears throat> this afternoon or evening. So reading volume, you cannot separate, as Nancy was saying, there's incidental word learning. We learn a lot of words from reading. So we, we get a concept because the author paints a picture or describes it. And so we start to develop our conceptual knowledge and then we learn a label for it. Now, here's the thing about reading. This is outside of school. It's correlational studies. I know the difference between correlation and causation, but there seems to be a relationship between how much you read and how well you do in school tasks, in school performance. A student who reads 20 minutes a day outside of the school day reads 1.8 million words and scores in the 90th percentile. The estimate is this student will learn about 2,700 new words a year from doing this, this volume of reading, 2,700 new words. Now, student B reads on average five minutes a day. The volume drops to 282,000 words. The student scores in the 50th percentile, and the estimate is the student will learn about 800 new words over the course of the year from this process of reading. Here's the difference. These two students could be in the same class, getting the same instruction, but the impact is different because of practice. How much practice did they actually get seeing these words, encountering these words over and over? Student C reads one minute a day outside of school. The volume drops to 8,000 words read. The student scores in the bottom 10 percentile, and the student learns zero new words for the course of the year. No vocabulary growth. Because practice makes the learning permanent. We're teaching vocabulary, we're introducing students to word solving strategies, we're growing their conceptual knowledge. But if they don't engage in practice, that incidental side doesn't grow. The only one that grows is the explicit side. And as Nancy said, you cannot teach all the words students need to learn simply through instruction. We've got to have students increase their reading volume. <clears throat> and as we noted, you can learn on average, depending on how many minutes you read, I'll change the number, about 2,200 words according to that last Mason, Stahl, Kathy Au, et cetera. It's a bargain since you can probably teach about three to 500 words a year through direct instruction and modeling. So we want to build the reading habits of our students. It's part of our vocabulary initiative. And as several of you noted, how do we encourage families to see that? Now, if you tell them there's soccer practice and they have to practice three days a week to play the game, they all get their kids soccer practice or piano practice. Reading practice is also important. <clears throat> so I've been thinking about this and summarizing the research that what do we know about vocabulary into this intentional initiative? So we're gonna to to talk about each of these. Making it intentional, vocabulary intentional through word selection and instruction. Making vocabulary transparent through teacher modeling of word solving and word learning. Making it usable where students actually produce the words in interactions with their peers, where they make it personal, where they're using the words on their own. And then we take vocabulary and we focus on vocabulary school-wide. That word learning is an important journey for every school, no matter how old the students are. Now, we're going to follow up with this as a 
rubric. We built this rubric. We've been testing this rubric out. This We're going to take it apart one by one. But in the follow-up email, you will get a, a draft of this rubric. You can modify it a little bit and say, here's the things that we're thinking about. But we're going to ask you to think about where you are and how you own each of these areas that I just named. So let's start off with the first area. And that first area is around making sure that it's intentional. And it really requires uh, two practices in particular that are worthwhile paying attention to. One is, do we understand how it is that we're going to select the words that we're going to utilize for direct instruction? And then what does sound direct instruction look like? Again, you can't teach 88,500 word families so you want to make sure that you're selecting the words that you need to select and that you're following that up with some really good sound kinds of uh, direct instruction. One of the dilemmas I think that all of us face is how do you choose the vocabulary to teach? So I'll share with you a, a study that uh, part of a study that Doug and I did a number of years ago. We were interested in finding out uh, about uh, what students at different grade levels knew about vocabulary. So here's one of the items. I'll let you take a look at that for a moment. If you could only teach one word, which word would you teach? Go ahead and drop that into the chat. If you only got one word to teach, which one would you do? I'm seeing aristocrat, empress. Some of you are saying minor. Yep, I agree. Minor, as it turns out, was the word that lots of students got hung up on. We did this with fourth graders, eighth graders, and 10th graders. Fourth graders, um, through fourth selection, chose most often incorrectly that it had something to do with somebody digging gold out of the ground. Now, if you're a fourth grader, in kinder in uh, in California, then you're learning all uh, about the gold rush. In other words, their background knowledge was what really influenced it. Eighth graders answered at the highest level of frequency for accuracy. Tenth graders, on the other hand, answered incorrectly many times, them choosing their uh, as a choice that it had to do with her being underage. Again, background knowledge. If you're 15 years old, that's what you're paying a lot of attention to. Your background knowledge actually influences what it is that you know about vocabulary and how it is that you do so. And as Heidi said, exactly, multiple meanings. I'm sure there are times for all of us where we're reading and we um initially misinterpret a particular term and then go back and read again and go, oh, oh, that's what it means, right? We have to make some decisions about how to be able to select the vocabulary that we have. And, and it isn't sufficient to simply have a publisher's recommendation of words. That's a good start, but we also want to give further consideration to that as well. And I'll use as an example, the book, The Giver, very commonly read in fifth and sixth grade. There are two terms that are used in the first uh, chapter, tunic and utopia. Now I have to make some decisions as a teacher. What, what am I going to teach? Tunic, it might be easy enough to do a little tiny bit of direct instruction and simply to be able to say, tunic, it's like a long shirt and move on. Utopia, on the other word, on the other hand, is a word that is absolutely critical to understanding the meaning of the text. So now, what I have to do is I have to think about how it is that they're going to get at that word. Is it representative in the case of utopia? In the giver, yes, it is absolutely critical to their understanding. And are they going to have to use it in their discussions or in their writing? I sure hope so. I sure hope that we get to talk about and write about utopia and dystopia um, in particular. But now I have to go down to that third level and give some more consideration to that. Is this word going to show up repeatedly? Yes, it actually is in that book. Can they use structural analysis? In other words, can they take the word apart? Utopia, really difficult word to be able to take apart um, and to use any morphological um, uh, knowledge uh, around that. But contextual knowledge, 
not only does it appear frequently, but there's a lot of context that's around it as well. And so for me, it seems to be, I can give them opportunities to figure it out. I can encounter that word with them and say to them, that seems like a really important word, not quite sure what it means. Let's start building our knowledge as we keep running into that word so that we get a deeper and deeper understanding of what that word means. In other words, I don't need to use direct instruction on that particular word. I want to equip them with the ability to be able to take apart um, uh, what's going on in the text to be able to figure a word out. Now, there are other times where you do need to use some direct instruction. There's nothing wrong with that. We just want to be wise about where it is that we're putting our instructional minutes. And direct instruction is a structure for um, uh, modeling uh, as well as providing some direct information. So let's take the word analyze as, uh, as an example for doing that. Now, there's actually been a lot of work on what sound direct instruction looks like and sounds like in vocabulary. And it starts off with labeling and defining it. I think that that's what most of us commonly think of when we think of direct instruction. So a, a teacher saying, for example, in the course of a reading, analyze means to look at something carefully so you can solve a problem. Sure, that's, that's a great start, but it can't stop there. That's not going to stick if that's all that happens. The second step of that, contextualize that, right? Ground that word in the, or, or that phrase in how it is that the author's using it. So I'm going to read that sentence now. The police detective analyzed the crime scene for clues. Since analyze means to look closely to solve a problem, I know that she's trying to figure out what happened. I'm contextualizing it. And then moving to a third step, giving a, a good example of what that looks like. Some of you have told me that you use Fortnite analysis videos on YouTube so that you can improve your online gaming skills. You're not just watching, you're solving problems to get better at the game. And then elaborate on those attributes. When somebody's analyzing something, they're breaking it apart into smaller pieces so that they can look at it more closely to understand. This police detective, if she wasn't looking carefully, she wouldn't be able to analyze the scene. And then give them some strategy information. I've heard this word used before on other TV crime shows. So I thought about how it was used and then I made a connection to the story that we're reading now. When you do direct instruction, take those couple of minutes to really move through those opportunities so that you can do it well, so that it sticks. Going back to the rubric around intentional instruction, um, uh, words are identified using a framework for instruction. That's where it is that we're headed for. And the word lists that are used include those general, specialized, and technical vocabulary that are shared across the grade levels or across the departments. So as Nancy was saying, we have this framework based on evidence Lots of vocabulary researchers say, here's how you pick words worth instruction. And as Nancy was saying, if you can use morphological analysis or, or structure of the words, or you can use <coughs> context, we should teach word solving. <clears throat> if the word is important and you can't use morphology or word parts, and you can't use context, you probably need to go to direct instruction. And if the word is not important like tunic. We just tell them it's a shirt and we move on. And so we have these two major instructional areas or, or uh, opportunities. Do we go to direct instruction or, and by the way, more commonly, do we move to word solving? Because when you look at text, authors often put it in context, not always, but often. And we tend to know a lot about word parts and morphology. And our profession has learned a bunch about morphological awareness and morphological instruction in the last two decades. So we do some work on modeling, the power of teacher modeling, opening up our brains and sharing with students 
how we figure out words. <clears throat> the power of teacher modeling. And we talk about this across the grade levels. What we're going to do with word solving is we're going to look inside the words. Yep. Now, we talk about <clears throat> thinking about that all the time. Let's look inside the word. That structural analysis, it's morphology. Now, we don't say we're going to use a prefix or a suffix or a root or a base or a cognate. We build that understanding of morphology. Let's look inside the word and see if there's any parts that we know that help us understand this word. It's not a one day lesson. It's over and over and over building a habit that students have. Now, if they don't know the prefix yet and they haven't been taught that prefix, we can't do that yet. But if they've had experience and in instruction with certain kinds of morphology, they know how to think about words. They just need reminders to build this habit. We also can look outside the word. When we look outside the word, we're looking at contextual analysis. How does the context help us understand what this word means? Now, authors do a lot of things to help us understand the words. Isabel Beck says, it's about 50% of the time that these context clues will work in authentic text. About 65 to 70% of the time they work in textbooks written for children. An authentic text around 50% of the time. Here are a bunch of ways that authors help us with context. Now, again, now we say to students, we're gonna look outside the word. So we might look at definitions or restatements or contrasts or punctuation. We learn how to think about the context in which this word occurred. If those two don't work, we can look further outside of the word and use our resources. <clears throat> and we think about asking a friend, looking it up, bookmarking dictionaries. <clears throat> and yes, a lot of students struggle with the context because they haven't had enough teacher modeling of how to do it, where we open up our brains and we show students, here's what I'm doing to figure out this word. What we tend to do is just tell students what the words mean <clears throat> rather than show them how to figure out the unknown words through active thinking about the text. Now, this time we're gonna to jump to a high school math teacher to show that word solving does not limit it to the primary grades. Teachers should be showing students how to think about words all the time. <clears throat> we're only gonna show you a little bit of this video in the interest of time, but the, and you'll have this on our YouTube channel. But the idea that all of us can open up our brains and show students how we think about word solving. <laughs>One of the common challenges that I've noticed in our class is breaking down some word problems. Um, so today what I'm going to have us do is look at breaking down a word problem and so we know um, kind of our best tactic to um, answer the question. Okay, so when I'm going through some word problems here, I'm just going to start by reading through the entire question that I can get a broad sense of what the question is asking me to do. So here, I would say determine whether the given quadratic polynomial y is equal to negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 5 has a maximum or minimum value. Then I'm going to go look at the question again and see what is the question asking me by kind of breaking down some of the parts of the question. Okay, so we have determine whether the given quadratic polynomial, and then I see a comma here, okay? That comma here is telling me that they're gonna give me an example of what a quadratic polynomial is here. They give me the example y is equal to negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 5. Now, I still wanna know what this is, what a quadratic polynomial is, to help me make sense of what's going on here. Okay, so I'm looking at the word polynomial and looking inside the word here at poly. I know that poly means multiple, okay? So we're looking at something that has multiple. And that second part of the word here, nomial, means terms. So here I'm looking at multiple terms, okay? So my example that I'm looking at has multiple terms. So then I'm looking at the word quadratic. And so breaking down that word again, 
Um, being careful here, I see that word quad. Now, when I think of quad, I think of four, like a quad on, you might take to the desert here. But we got to be careful here because the example that we're looking at is actually, it is a degree two polynomial. Okay, and that degree two polynomial is looking at that exponent two here. Our highest exponent tells us what family of functions or polynomials we're looking at. So the quadratic function is a particularly important family because it has certain features that we're looking at and we'll be talking about in future classes that are important. Okay, and one of those really important features is our maximum or minimum value. And so what's really nice about quadratic functions is we have a very targeted look at what a maximum looks like because our quadratic functions or degree two polynomials are looking at having one maximum or one minimum. So it's a really good starting point for us. Okay, so that's kind of a broad sense of what's going on with this question here. Now, when we're looking at this, we're looking at we either have a maximum or a minimum value. And when I'm thinking about this problem, I am thinking what, there's gotta be a feature here that is going to tell me whether I have a maximum or minimum value. And that- We're gonna leave you hanging on what the answer actually is. But you know, Doug, one of the things I love that he does is that he's really applying his disciplinary knowledge in thinking about all of that. Not only taking the vocabulary apart, using some morphological uh, analysis, as well as drawing their attention to particular marks, um, commas, and so on that are there, but he's really thinking about this as a mathematician, because that's really where they're deepening their vocabulary knowledge, not just acquiring it across the breadth of the words that they know, but actually deepening their knowledge using increasingly that disciplinary logic to do so. I appreciate he doesn't just move immediately to solving the problem. Mm -hmm. He shows students how he thinks about this. And if we watch more of it, he invites students to do some of the think alouds as well. This is a small group. You can see the rest of the class is working. Um, on their other work collaboratively and independently. And this is a group of students who are having some difficulty with this. <clears throat> so he's unpacking how he's thinking of this and he doesn't immediately move to solve the problem. He helps them think about what all the words mean in this problem. And that's what we need from every one of us. Imagine first period, second period, third period, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, your teachers open up their brains and model word solving. And yes, there are times when we go to direct instruction, the words cannot be solved. They haven't been taught the roots yet. So we go to direct instruction. But when the word is solvable, we show students how to solve words. And we build this over and over again with students daily. <clears throat> and yes, you'll have access to the video and this recording and the PowerPoint. That, all, that comes from Corwin at the end. We want to keep this on mind. That when we select words, which ones? Do we need direct instruction and which ones do we engage in modeling and word solving? We've argued that word solving is a daily phenomenon that students need to experience their teachers showing them how to think about words every single day. The third part of our intentional vocabulary initiative is having students use the words, listening to the words, processing the words, is great, it's important, it's prerequisite. Someone said it's the I do phase, exactly. But if you're not producing the language, you're really not learning the language. Mm -hmm. Learners need to use the vocabulary in meaningful exchanges with each other. <clears throat> they need to talk to acquire language, scientific language, mathematics language, academic language, they need to produce language, not just listen to others use language. Now we help them think about this. And here's an example of success criteria. When we're talking, when we're having a group discussion, this is what success looks like when students are talking. So we explicitly say, this is the kind of discussion we're looking for. Now we spend some time 
on um, what do we mean by collaborative learning? So let me process that with you for a moment. So <clears throat> in the umbrella of collaborative learning, we think of group work and productive group work. Both get students to produce language, both allow for academic interaction. Here's how they're different. Group work is better, is useful when you want the students to clarify their ideas, their beliefs, their values, their opinions. It's a clarification. Productive group work, however, is when you want students to consolidate their understanding, often using argumentation. Group work has the goal that students are going to share, whereas productive group work is all about problem solving. And then probably the biggest difference for me anyway, group work has no accountability or group accountability, whereas productive group work has individual accountability. You can hold each student accountable for what they contributed to. There's a whole research base called social loafing and that some people in groups don't do their share because they're loafing in the group. So if a teacher only does the group work side, they might have some social loafers. <clears throat> and if they have productive group work, they have evidence of students learning that they can use to feed forward. Here are some group work examples. We're not saying get rid of them. There are good uses from turn to your partner and talk, think pair square, carousels where they walk around the room, novel ideas only, opinion stations, strongly agree, agree, disagree. Those are useful to get students talking, but you don't yet have any evidence from each learner about their use of academic language. <clears throat> Productive group work examples, and just put a few examples are conversation roundtable, where you fold the paper and you take notes as other people listen. They're required to actually listen to other people. Numbered heads together, Kagan strategy. Each table has a number. Each person at the table has a number. You have a conversation at your table. You roll the dice. It's going to be person four. Everyone directs their attention to person four. You roll the dice again. It's table three. Collaborative poster. You can only contribute to the poster in writing in the color of the marker I gave you. Put your name on the bottom in that color. So when I walk around, I can see you wrote in red, you wrote in brown, et cetera. Book clubs, de facto productive group work. You have a job to do in your book club. You have a role assignment. Jigsaw, you have your home group, your expert group, your home group. Walking review, you have review questions and you walk around and you collect information from other people as you're doing your review. These are just a few examples of the difference between group work and productive group work. Again, both allow students to produce language. But if we only use the group work side and you're standing on that side of the room, the group over there knows they can talk about whatever they want because <laughs> you'll probably not catch them. And that's a certain amount of social interaction is great. However, we want products from students that show their actual use of the target vocabulary you've been asking them to teach. Some examples, I saw this one in the chat already. <clears throat> a pyramid. Here are a pyramid game. Let's play what we know. Let's use a language to play a review pyramid game around the ancient Greeks. Here's one way to get students to talk to each other using academic language. We can do concept circles. What was the definition of planet before August 2006? There were nine. And here's how they were defined. After 2006, they changed the definition of what it means to a planet because the concept of planet changed in 2006. There's a debate about what it means. So we can have concept circles where we talk about what these concepts mean and use language to explain them. <clears throat> we can have word sorts. Collaborative word sorts, where students are given terms and they build hierarchies or relationships with them and all the language they're producing and the teacher can walk around and say, yep, I can see how you've organized this terminology to make sense of this unit. All kinds of ways of getting students to produce the language, the academic language that we're teaching them. So as we check our rubric again, are students talking to each other? Are there oral language practices across the school that teachers integrate peer talk and small group collaborative activities each day? So students are asked to produce academic language, the language of school. If you're whatever language of instruction is, 
That's the language students are being asked to produce. And vocabulary development really requires that kind of intentionality. We can't only leave vocabulary development up to those individual activities. It's got to be anchored in how it is that we select words and model them and provide direct instruction. And importantly, that we give them lots of opportunities to be able to produce that language in the company of their peers. When, when those sorts of things happen, then we can more firmly anchor those individual activities as well. We're not going straight to those. We're making sure that there are other uh, ways that ha happen as well. I saw this mentioned in the chat a little earlier about Freyer cards. Freyer cards are a great way to be able to support the individual learning of students. Again, remember, not that they haven't had other experiences. For those of you that are unfamiliar with a Freyer card, the targeted word is in that top left-hand quadrant. This is from a world history class. The definition, and here's a really important part of this, the definition is composed by the student. They are not copying this from the teacher's uh, projection or just simply looking it up in the glossary. They're composing it in their own words. Down in that bottom right-hand quadrant is an opposite or not. Not every word has an antonym to it. It's an opposite. The opposite of ultimatum would be a compromise. And then in this particular case, inviting students to be able to draw something that will help them to remember visually what that word is. They were studying uh, about the, the um, beginning of World War II. And so this student uh, reminded herself that an ultimatum was something that Hitler had um, uh, issued. Here's a different example in a chemistry class, um, a polar molecule. I love the picture that the student wrote or the student drew in order to be able to help remember a polar molecule. But again, the secret of this is they are composing their own definitions. There's there's thought about why it is that Freyer cards are useful, and it has to do with sustained attention. When you're simply copying something, you are not necessarily attending to all the features of it. But there's all this cognition that's happening along with attention whenever you have to compose your own uh, definitions for that. Other examples, and again, we're kind of at the individual uh, level as well. I, and this actually ties back to my example earlier uh, using the word utopia. Um, a word map can be something that is a class development or an individual development. I could have put utopia right there in the middle of that word map, for example. And we could have built over time what is this word? Um, what, what's the meaning that we're coming to with this word? What are some examples that we found? What is it like or what is it similar to? Again, it's the idea that there is a tension that is being uh, sustained attention that's being placed uh, on this. Another example here's from one of my colleagues in her physics class. Uh, and what she does is she sections off about the last 20 pages of their physics notebooks, and they set themselves up a chart that looks very much like this. And as she introduces new terminology, they do uh, self-awareness. Um, is that word new to me or I've heard it before um, or it's something I'm familiar and I can define it with. And they build their own charts over time. What are some examples of that? What's a definition of that? Again, we very rarely learn a word one time only. We are not one trial learners. We need to be able to go deeper and deeper into those words. And yes, exactly. Uh, and that, that is very, very much um, what uh, Bob Marzano talks about with vocabulary development. I love this strategy. I think some of you have used this before as well. Um, go to your local uh, paint store 
and let them know that you're a teacher and that you'd love to be able to get some of those paint strips with the shades of meaning on them. And then challenge students to be able to develop uh, shades of meaning and then actually write sentences that are using all those. When you're in sixth grade, you need to know the difference between somebody who's an acquaintance versus a friend versus a confidant, right? This is all about the social relationships. We want to be able to teach all of those nuances of words. By the way, back to the standards, uh, nuances of words. Here's another one I love. This is useful at any grade level. I have done this with second graders. I have done this with 12th graders. And it's generative sentences. Again, what we're looking to be able to do is to build students' ability, increasing ability, to be able to utilize words and phrases in their own ways, in under their own command. With generative sentences, what you do is... Um, after teaching um, what some of those words are that you want them to do, it's a challenge for students. You give them a word and the conditions about the word. So it isn't, here's a word, now write a sentence, but rather, here's a condition for writing that word. So in this particular case, the direction from this teacher, use the word volcanoes in the fourth position in a sentence. What that does is forces some thinking about the syntax, how it is that that's utilized. Sinai wrote this sentence, the name for volcanoes in the Pacific is called the ring of fire. Um, different student, same challenge, actually wrote this sentence, which I suppose technically is accurate uh, as well. But here's what's really important about that is that it causes students to be able to consider how it is that they use the word volcanoes. Instead of allowing a child, for example, to use the word volcano, no, no, I want you to use it in the plural. And I want you to think about where this happens in the syntax of the sentence. We have students keep track of the words that they are writing, the words that they're developing uh, along the way so that they can see their progress. This is one of my former ninth graders um, uh, doing this as well. There are lots of different ways that you can do this, but again, having that forced choice, having that um, those conditions that are set out, using the word cell in the third position in a sentence that is more than six words long requires them to do a lot more consolidation of skills. They have to think about grammar. They have to think about syntax and composition and so on. Using the word because as the first word in a sentence that is less than 10 words long causes them, by the way, to have to think about dependent and independent clauses because you can't write a full sentence that starts with the word because without having a clause that's in it. By the way, when you have kids who say, because I said so, you, and you let them know, that's a fragment. You have to finish out what that sentence is. Um, Sinai's uh, example of this, we typically do this, might have five or six words. And then on some nights, we'll say, choose one of the sentences that you wrote and use that uh, to be able to write a summary paragraph. So in this case, she wrote the name for volcanoes in the Pacific is called the Ring of Fire. These are volcanoes in Hawaii, South America, and Asia. Some are active. That means they erupt. Some are dormant that means they are quiet. What we've done in that process is move from the word to the sentence to the paragraph for students. A lot of nice scaffolding that's there. And in the meantime, consolidation around the knowledge that they have, not just of single words, but of concepts that go along with them. I'll show you a few more uh, examples of this. And I imagine hopefully this 
uh, resonates with many of you, you're doing these kinds of things, making sure that there are sentence frames that are available for them to be able to use in their writing. When we have blanks in there, those blanks don't necessarily represent a single word. It's often a phrase or an idea that's there. But in using sentence frames, you help students to understand the relationship between the academic language, which is mostly what you see on the screen right now, and the academic vocabulary that they need to use in order to complete it. Another example of a paragraph frame, uh, this one being utilized at the high school level. Again, lots of academic language templates, if you will. Now, sometimes I'll hear teachers say, well, you know, it's, it's not really helping them if they're getting templates like this. Actually, that's the way all writers write. We internalize a whole bunch of templates. And over time, as we become better writers, we begin to innovate on those templates. But we start with a framework. And I'll, I'll go ahead and share this uh, as well. The single best-selling writing textbook for college freshmen, and by the way, a great one to be able to use if you're a high school teacher, They Said, I Said, uh, by Graf, uh, Kathy Graf and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tony Graf and Kathy Bergenstein. Um, and it is full of templates for students college writers to be able to, in this particular case, introduce an ongoing debate as well. We are not teaching kids to cheat whenever we use frames like that as well. That rubric, personalizing that instruction is an essential part of what it is that we do. We move from uh, independent work that is only happening sporadically in different places, but making sure that there's a spiral review that's happening and that there's a lot of metacognition, not just cognition that's happening. We'll finish up by saying that the way that this all happens is by making vocabulary a priority, by creating a school-wide focus. We have silos of excellence in every school and every district. But what we have to make sure of is that we find ways to be able to elevate that practice, to be able to share what that practice looks like across schools as well. I want to thank you so much for spending time with this. Megan, I'm going to turn this over to you um, because I know that you've got some giveaways to be able to do. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. This was a wanna, wonderful webinar. Yes, I want to thank everybody for what it is that you do um, uh, in making sure that students have the vocabulary that they need in order to be able to reach their aspirations, to express their ideas. Uh, it, it's, um, it's the right work to be able to do. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.